So hello everyone, good afternoon, good morning for some of you. Um, welcome to our second session of the day on uh, Chronos Flow for Basin Modeling in Complex Tectonics. We are very happy to, to be here. Thank you again for participating to the meeting. We hope you will find it interesting and useful. My name is uh, Marie-Caille, I will moderate the event and your main speaker will be Alcide Thébault. Both of us are geologists. Uh, we've been working for many years in the software development team of PC Prolab, and we were particularly involved in uh, our basin modeling solutions development, including Chronos Flow. So we hope we'll be able to give you a good presentation and answer all the questions you may have. Before we actually start the meeting, here are a few guidelines. As you probably noticed, you are all automatically muted, so you cannot speak. If you have questions during the presentation, please use the questions panel that is available at right hand side. Do not wait at the question breaks to actually write down your questions because otherwise we'll have a long list and it will be harder for us to answer them all. And in any case, if we cannot answer uh, everything live, we will do it afterwards by email. You will also find on the right a polls panel in which we will ask you questions from time to time. So if you could have a look, that would be great. And finally, the full meeting is recorded and we will post it in a few days on our YouTube channel. And I will now leave the stage to Elsie. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. And hello, everyone. So this is the agenda of today's session. I will first start by presenting Chronos Flow, by presenting the software and showing you what is the overall workflow from restoration to modeling and trying to show you as well the specificity and benefits of the tool. The second part of the presentation will be dedicated to examples of applications in compressive and extensive settings. And the final part will be a demonstration of the software. In between each sections, we will have a Q&A break during which we will answer all your questions, or try to at least. So first, let's have a look at Chronos Flow. But before that, actually, let's review what is the classic basin modeling workflow. When we want to perform basin modeling, the first thing to do is to build the present day section. For that, we actually define the stratigraphy, so the layers, the lithologies within these layers, the source rock information, the thermal behavior at present day and through time. And that section is usually, or that model is usually vertical pillar based. So that means that the faults are not explicitly represented. Once we have defined that present day model, we need to reconstruct his history through time. So we need to reconstruct the history of deformation. And this is done through a vertical backstripping where we take into account the decompaction of the layers through time. And there is no shortening or extension that is taken into account. And finally, once we have that reconstruction, we can perform a forward simulation in which we will compute the thermal history the maturity of the source rocks and the hydrocarbon and water migration within the model. And here again, there is no specific fault modeling that is usually done. We actually see here that we have some limitations of the model where we see that it is not adapted to complex regions that underwent a strong extensive or a compressive regime where you may have some geometries, some geology that cannot be properly represented at present day and through time. And this is actually important to take it into account, as we know that we may have folding and faulting that has a critical impact on burial and the source rock maturity, the hydrocarbon carbon expulsion and the migration pathways, and also on the charge and fluids composition within the potential accumulations. So what do we need to actually take into account? What do we need to be able to handle when we deal with complex geologies? So first of all, we need to be able to have a mesh that will explicitly model and take into account the geometry at present day and is able to handle all the complexity of the geology. We need to have an unstructured mesh in which uh, we will have some specific cells and in which we will have the faults that are explicitly taken into account and where we no longer have vertical pillar-based grid. In addition to that, the movement along these continuities and the lateral displacement must be accounted for, which means that the vertical backstripping is 
no longer enough and we need to replace it with a step-by-step -step restoration that is able to take into account the extension or the compression of the model through time and properly represent the geometry and the geology uh, through time as well. And finally, we need to have a new simulator in order to handle the deformation and then new type of mesh. And we need a new simulator that is able to properly model the fault impact on the fluid flow. So the workflow that we propose is a four-step uh, workflow that starts Actually, it's very similar to the classic model building, but with some uh, specificities. The, so it starts with the present day model building in which we actually just draw the section by taking into account all the stratigraphic uh, units that are necessary for basin modeling purposes. So we have the entire sedimentary column in which we take into account all the petroleum system elements like the reservoirs, the source rocks, and any units that have a petrophysical behavior on the migration. It's better if that section is balanced when we start the workflow. Then we perform the step-by-step -step backward restoration, taking into account decompaction, erosion, and so on. So we create one step for each event during the restoration. Once we have that restoration, we compute a unique mesh through time. So that mesh is continuously deformed, and it is the same mesh during the entire time of the restoration and the deformation. Once that mesh is computed, we can perform the basic modeling forward simulation in which we will compute actually the same thing as for classical basic modeling. So the source rock maturity, the temperature, the pressure, the expulsion masses and the saturation evolution through time. So Kronos Flow is actually the tool, the new 2D kinematic tool that allows us to perform that workflow. So Kronos Flow was created in order to produce very easily and rapidly consistent geological scenarios. And that was done primarily for basin modelers. And we see that it can also be used by structuralists. The key was to find the good balance between an acceptable kinematics and the productivity. So that means we want users to be able to perform the full workflow in an amount of time that is short enough to comply with uh, the standards and the objective of the industry. So in terms of technical quality and ergonomics, so we offer several deformation solutions. So the solutions can be either geometry driven, like the oriented shear, the flexural sleep, the moving least square, or they can be a mechanic driven. And in that case, it would be a finite element method. The restoration will account for the decompaction of the sediments because you will be able to define the facies in each block of the section. And you can also take into account the erosion. As I mentioned before, ergonomics is a key element. So we try to reach the best performance for the engines for them to be almost instantaneous. So the, the deformation is instantaneous. We have an automated detection and selection of sources and targets. And everything is mouse driven. So this is actually shown right here in that little video where you see that you just have to move the block and then drag and drop it to the location that you want to perform the deformation. And then the deformation is applied automatically. All the deformations that you perform is saved within a kinematic scenario that is represented right here. And that tree allows you actually to do several things. It allows you to test various hypotheses and it also allows you to track everything that you have performed in order to either share it with your colleagues or to remember it when you go back to your project a few months later. So once the restoration is performed, we actually compute a mesh and that mesh comes from a new gridding technology, which allows us to create a single grid that is continuously deformed through time. So this is what you can see right here. And actually what you are able to see is that every cell of the mesh can be tracked and can be followed through time. So that means that there is no remeshing at every uh, step of the restoration but it is the same mesh that is continuously deformed. On top of that, the folds only act as juxtaposition interface. So that means that all the properties like the overburden, the temperature, the heat flow are continuous across the fold plane. So we have a continuity of the properties, both laterally and through time. When that mesh is computed, we can perform a classic basin modeling, forward basic bundling. So we define the petrophysical behavior of the facies, the source rocks, 
the thermal condition through time, and we can compute any output uh, classical properties like the temperature, here the thermal conductivity. So I don't know if it's exactly on, on time, uh, in sync with what I'm saying, but here we have the vitrinite reflectance, the transformation ratio, which is computed in the source rock, the capillary pressure that will drive part of the migration, and finally, the hydrocarbon saturation, which allows us to identify where we have our uh, main accumulations. This is quite classical, but within a very advanced grid. In addition to that innovative mesh, we also have a very specific fault model. So as I said, the faults are explicitly taken into account within the grids by being just the interface between blocks. So for us, it's just an interface, just a line, but actually for the simulator is much more than that. Each fault has a specific mesh, which is co-refined with the surrounding layers. So the fault is defined by a core zone here in purple, a damage zone in orange, and it is co-refined on both sides with the units that we uh, have within the, the section. You have actually cells within the faults in which the pressure is unknown and will be computed through time. So the, these cells are actually part of the overall mesh. In addition to that, you can actually define factors for example, here factors A and B that will control the permeability and the capillary pressure of the faults compared to the capillary pressure and the permeability of the surrounding units. So for example, here the factors A and B allow us to control uh, the permeability and the capillary pressure that will drive uh, the hydrocarbon to enter within the damage zone of the fault. Then through the definition of the thickness of the damage zone and the factor C, we will be able to tune the permeability along the fault and allow the flow to occur on both sides of the fault. Finally, through the thickness of the core zone and the factor D, we will be able to control the permeability of the flow across the fault through the core zone. So all these factors can be modified through time and can vary from uh, one fault to another. Let's have a look at how it works, actually, with a simple example where the fault will be considered to be transparent. So actually, it means that all the factors are set to one. For that, we will use a model offshore Brazil, so a passive margin, which represents, which presents, sorry, right here, a toe thrust with the movement of this block on top of this one. Here, if uh, we have a look, so we start with an already relatively mature uh, system with some migration that already occurred, some long distance migration that occurred, and with hydrocarbon, some hydrocarbon that is trapped at the top of the anticline. So with the movement of the block that we see right now, we see that when we have some contacts uh, between the reservoir, so some reservoir juxtaposition, we allow the flow to occur from one fault block to the other. So with that, we are able to properly represent the migration of the hydrocarbon through the faults through time, so through the history of the deformation, and the final representation that we have of the hydrocarbons properly represents what occurred uh, during the history of the basin. This concludes the, the presentation of the overall workflow and key benefits of the tool. So I think we can have our first Q&A break. So Marie, do we have some questions? Well, actually, just one that I answered directly uh, related to the development of fractures, so totally another scale. Uh, we just get one from Antonio. Hello, Antonio. Uh, which options are available to define the basal term and boundary of the model? The main option that we will have is the heat flow at the base of the model. So here you see that the model can involve some crusts. So some continental crust or ocean crust, depending on, on your model, and you will be able to define the heat flow at the base of that model and make it vary laterally and through time. You can, if you want, integrate as well a lithospheric model and define the temperature or the heat flow at the base of that uh, lithospheric model. However, in this version of the software, the lithospheric model is relatively simple and uh, you will not be able to tune the um, evolution of the geometry uh, through time. Yes, so it means you cannot define rifting uh, for now. However, this is ongoing uh, works uh, at IFP, so all of these options 
that we have in the regular Temis flow approach will be available in a future release. We have another question. What are the challenges of working with simple vertical pillar grids and taking it to complex geometry after we build the present day model? Yes, uh, I will try to give an answer to this one. Uh, well, I, I, I'll go through a simple example. With a regular pillar, uh, vertical pillar grid, for instance, you cannot account for a reverse fault because in the uh, Bayesian modeling packages, an horizon is a continuous line from the left border to the right border, and you cannot handle multi z geometries. So if you have to deal with this kind of geometry, you really need to, to move away from this vertical grid. Also, complex geometry often meets shortening or extension of the basin that you cannot get if you stick to vertical pillar grids. I hope it answers your questions. So that's it for now, Alcide. Let's move to the case studies. Okay, so indeed, let's move to some examples in both compressive and extensive settings. So two case studies. So the first one will actually be uh, in Bolivia. This is the present day section, which is uh, balanced and that uh, already come from some restoration steps that we obtained. So we have 15 stratigraphic units that are presented right here with their ages and their lithology content. In within these 15 units, we have three main source rocks, which are the thin shelly layers right here. And we have some main reservoirs, uh, which are here represented in orange and yellow, and everything is within the Devonian units. Here is the main restoration. So we start with something that is quite simple, that is not represented uh, right here. So we are within that uh, foreland uh, basin. So everything is more or less flat. And then at 12 million years, we start actually having some compression with every scale that will move one by one. So here, now, here, and there. So here is the, the total compre compression, which results in a total shortening of 31 kilometer. So once we have performed that restoration, taking into account here, as, you see, as you've seen the erosion, the eroded material every time, we build a single grid that continuously follows the deformation through time. We perform some temperature uh, simulation in order to check the calibration. So we compare the results to the well data in temperature and vitrinite, and we have a good match uh, for, bo for both temperature and uh, vitrinite reflectance. And this is the maturity that we observe at present day. So here by seeing the vitrinite reflectance, and we actually see that nice repetition of sequences with the different uh, scales uh, that we are able to represent uh, very precisely here with that uh, continuous deformation of the mesh. As we are also able to track the cell through time, we will actually be able to see the evolution of the maturity for the three main source rocks. And this is represented here within that graph with the expelled, uh, the generated, in that case, sorry, the ex generated masses from the different source rocks. So we see that we have a first generation phase that takes a long amount of time, and then the second generation phase, which corresponds to that very recent uh, and thick deposit of material. We can also see how that translates into uh, hydrocarbon saturation evolution through time. So this is what we see here. So the very at the very beginning of the basin, then, as I said, the simple burial, which corresponds to a little bit of expulsion from the source rocks. And then everything occurs very recently from 12 to 0 million years, where here you see you start having some migration at the top of the structures or underneath the faults. So this is the present day state that we obtain, and we will actually look at it a bit more in detail. So here you see you have some main accumulations within the anticline structures or underneath the faults. So actually what is very interesting to see is that we are able to see some remobilization, some dismigration of the hydrocarbon. So here what we see, for example, at 3.7 million years is that accumulation right here within that block which correspond to that reservoir layer. And with the movement of that block on top of this one, we see that the reservoirs that were connected here are now connected at the top of the structure. And that allows a dismigration of these hydrocarbons, remobilization, and a new migration up here at the top of the structure, and a little bit in that structure right here as well.
In the end, uh, what did we get from that section? So actually we were able to represent precisely some known fields, so which actually validates the hydrocarbon migration. So this one and this one. We actually identified two prospects that were already uh, identified and that were already under investigation and which were validated with that model. So they were drilled in 2019 when actually uh, the study was done in 2018 and they were successfully drilled. So the model actually pro precisely predicted uh, the type of hydrocarbon that were expected to be found within these uh, prospects. And finally, we identified right here a new carboniferous play. So we were expecting more Devonian reservoirs, but actually here we identified a carboniferous play that uh, should be further investigated. So we've seen how the, that whole workflow benefits a compressive system. Let's, now let's have a look at an extensive uh, model where we actually will see that by representing properly the faults, we will actually have a, a strong benefits. So this is the model at present day. So this is a passive margin offshore Canada with actually a better description of the stratigraphy and something a bit more detailed as well in terms of lithology. So everything came from a seismic stratigraphy here. So you have a, a plastic, so a mix of shale and sandstones that are represented uh, here. And uh, in order to drive the restoration, we actually used seven restoration steps uh, that came from Litotech. So we started from a balance section that we refined. So here you see that you only have seven units that we refined into 25, I think. And we use the paleobathymetry at every time step in order to drive the restoration within Chronosflow. So this is the restoration that we uh, obtained. So it's a simple passive margin. And what is interesting to see is that at 30 million years, here we have a destabilization of the platform with uh, the creation of folds. So here we have some extensive, so some normal folds that are created here and here a compressive system at the base of the platform until and then until present day, we have a simple uh, burial. How does that translate in terms of pressures? I will not uh, talk that much about the temperature and maturity that I've already presented within the previous case. So here we'll focus more on the pressure and migration aspect. In terms of pressure, here uh, we have a look at the overpressure at 34 million years, and we made two hypotheses, two different scenarios. In the first one, the folds are supposed to be transparent, so they do not have any specific behavior and it's only the juxtaposition of the layers on both sides of the fold that will actually have an impact on the water flow. And in the second case, we define the folds as in, totally impermeable, so we prevent any flow to occur between the different fold blocks. So this is the evolution of the overpressure in the two cases. And what we observe is that uh, right here, we have a strong compartmentalization that occurs until present day, and we actually have two scenarios that may tell us what will occur when drilling. So we have the worst case scenario right here with a strong overpressure and the best case scenario right here with a lower uh, overpressure. We only have one well for like calibration, which is located on the platform, and that area is not affected by the faults. So the calibration is very similar in the two cases and it's actually good and we have no way of telling which of the two scenarios is uh, the right one. So both scenarios can be considered to be valid and they are just two equiprobable scenarios which gave, give us, as I said, the best and worst case scenario. And now for the saturation. So this is the present day result. So that derived actually in that case from the transparent model uh, pressure regime. So here we are able to identify several accumulations of interest at uh, present day. And for each accumulation, we will, because we ran a, a compositional uh, migration, we are able to understand as well the quality of the hydrocarbons. So we can have some additional properties like the GOR, the phases, and the API degree for the hydrocarbons within uh, the model. Finally, what we can do as well is as I made the comparison for the pressure, we can also compare the different uh, results that we can obtain with the impermeable or the transparent faults. So this is before, actually right when the um, faults become active. Here with the evolution, we actually see that we have a difference of behavior. So for example, in this case here, in the transparent case, we see that all the hydrocarbons on both sides of the faults were remobilized and migrated at the 
of the structure, when here we see that some of the hydrocarbons were actually kept on one side of the fault. Same here, where everything migrated here and there, when here everything was kept within each uh, fault block. And that results at present day in different scenarios, where here we have actually similar accumulations, but here we have a stronger dismigration. And here we have an accumulation that is not present here. And on the other hand, here we have one accumulation that is not present there. So this as well uh, will allow you to test various hypotheses and understand what is the right scenario if you are able to uh, repro reproduce one known accumulation or, um, or not. So just to give you some figures, some ideas of how long it took to run these models and perform uh, these studies, the um, restoration took one to three days from a balanced section. So this will depend on the section complexity and the knowledge that the users has on the deformation scenario. The mesh building is actually instantaneous and each simulation takes a very short amount of time. So a temperature simulation takes less than two minutes. A temperature pressure simulation takes around five minutes and uh, migration simulations take uh, a few minutes and up to 15 minutes generally. So the overall study time, uh, because of course you need to spend time calibrating or testing various scenarios, will take between one to two or three weeks, depending as well on the area complexity and the objectives to reach. So that concludes uh, the presentation of the two case studies. Uh, so Marie, I don't know if you have any questions. We have one question related to okay. the pressure calibration and the Canada case, uh, saying that there is a sudden pressure kick seen from the model. What does, does this imply if you go to your pressure logs? Yes, here. Yes, indeed. So actually here we see that uh, that increase of, of pressure corresponds to uh, these two units, uh, which are um, underneath uh, this uh, unit right here, which is uh, Shelly. And so the kick of pressure actually comes from this uh, unit right here, which is uh, more impermeable. And the, the, the data points are actually from a, a well that is projected onto, um, onto the, the model. So it's actually further out from the, from the model. So which is why uh, the, the, actually the trend that we see within the observed data is not uh, represented here. It's not here because actually we can assume that maybe along that well, that uh, unit was not uh, present or is present at a deeper depth. Another question uh, related to the code, is it based on 2D heat diffusion or multi-1D? Uh, it's a 2D heat diffusion, so it's a full scheme uh, diffusion. So we take into account all the cells that, uh, so we call it the O scheme. So we take for the computation in one cell, we take into account all the cells that are surrounding uh, that cell. So it's not just multi-1D, it's a full scheme uh, computation. Um, another question, is there any slide on heat flow variations cell history from the model? Yes, yes, you can. It's true that we haven't displayed them uh, here, but maybe during the demo, yeah, I will show, you, show it in, during the demo. But yes, of course, everything is heat flow driven. So actually what we, we compute the heat flow evolution uh, through time. So you can uh, represent the heat flow values through the what we call the norm of the, of the heat flow. So it will represent the, the value along the the main uh, di direction uh, and that can be that can be displayed uh, of course uh, and seen and on tracked for each cell of the model indeed and tracked through time yes of course you can track it through time yes. so this is it Elsie. i think we can move to the demo knowing that we have 12, 12 oh. minutes left so now you should be able to see uh, the application so chronos flow here and the idea of uh, this uh, demo will be to show you on a simple model, the entire workflow from A to Z. So from beginning to till the end. So here we start, as I said, from the present day digitalization. So this is the section here that is already drawn with all the horizons. So this can be drawn manually or imported from an outside software. Um, and so here we see all the features. So the seven different uh, horizons that give us that uh, stratigraphic scale and the different faults as well that were uh, added into the model. So here to the right, you can check that everything is correct. You can check your contacts to make sure that 
uh, everything is good for the restoration. You can check that you do not have any uh, mistake with your stratigraphy and that you do not have any areas that are too small uh, for the computation or that should not be here. When it's done, you can create the model. So here you move to the second step. So here you see you have all the main steps at the top. And in that step, you can actually define your section properties, which will be the stratigraphy and the facies. So here you see that the stratigraphy is already uh, represented, but some uh, patches are not uh, properly represent uh, uh, identified. So you just need to correct that quickly by selecting the patch and drag and drop it in the stratigraphic unit that corresponds to that patch. You can also do that uh, through that table here that allows you to select all uh, the patches at once and with a right click, edit patch and select uh, the, um, sorry, edit patch and select the proper uh, stratigraphy uh, right here. So right click, edit patch and the proper stratigraphy. So here you see that everything is properly filled. We do not have any unassigned uh, patches and we can now move on to the facies definition. So because I made a mistake before I selected the lithology and not the, um, and not the, the, the units, I will actually just redo the definition of the lithology for that unit. So I will define it with some upper continental uh, crusts. The lower Jurassic will be our source rock. So it will be a shaley lithology. Let's zoom in to see things better. These mid Jurassic and upper Jurassic units will actually be 50-50. Uh, so it will be a mix of clastics. The lower Cretaceous units will be our reservoirs. So sandstone. The upper Cretaceous will be our sea. So a strong shale as well. And the most recent units will be just some shaley facies. So here it is. We have defined the lithologies for the entire uh, section and we can move to the restoration step. So I validate the present day and I move to the restoration step. So this is now the restoration uh, editor. So to the left, this is where you can uh, track everything that you are doing. Uh, you can actually here also display a background grid to represent in uh, more what you're doing in space. And to the right, this is where you will have all the different deformation modes. So let's actually have a look at uh, some of them, actually at all of them. So the first one that I will show you here is the sliding deformation mode. So this will allow you to slide one full block onto another one. So for that, we can actually display here the full blocks to understand what are our different full blocks. Let's go back to the edges. And then I can, if I want to displace uh, create a deformation, I can simply select the block and drag and drop it to wherever I want it to be. So one way, so forward, backward, sorry, or forward, or the other way. So you see, you can, so if you made a mistake, you can perform a control Z in order to do the deformation that was performed. So I can, here I can select forward and backward. The second deformation mode is with two constraints. So where you will actually be able to use, for example, the paleobathymetry line or a reference line on top of your faults to constrain the deformation. So here, let's draw uh, a certain paleobathymetry like this. And then let's remove the top units to actually uh, simplify the, the deformation. And let's have a look at uh, how that would work. So here you see that when I select the block, if I zoom in actually, you see that the top of the block became blue, the bottom became green. And I get closer to the paleobathymetry, you see that the paleobathymetry turns blue. And to, in order to tell me that it will be the blue side that will be uh, adapted to the paleobathymetry. And if I go the other way and I select close to the green, it will be the green, so here, because it's a fault, I cannot do it. So here it's just the top that I can adapt to the paleobathymetry. Then in this case, same thing, I have a blue side and a green side. And actually here what you will see is that the top will be on the paleobathymetry and the green will be automatically set to the fault uh, right here. And this is how you can quickly do some uh, fault, uh, some block restoration. 
So here you see, you can do them one by one very quickly and adapt the block at the same time to a reference line and to the fold. The final deformation mode that we have, here is the manual deformation, where you will actually be able to uh, adapt every single point, every single interface or horizon to the other, to the corresponding horizon on the other side of the fold. So here you will have a perfect match, a perfect restoration of the fold throw. So here you adapt each uh, horizon, and this one you let it free, and with the right click, you see here that you have uh, the right deformation. So this is actually just to show you the different uh, deformation modes. You see that everything that I have done is tracked and saved uh, here within the, that tab, and I can just go back to the initial stage by clicking here on zero. So this time I will perform the proper restoration that I want uh, to do. So actually the first restoration step is moving all these four blocks together on uh, top of this one. So actually restore this main fault right here. So in order to do that, I will first change in the contact manager which fault is active and which fault is inactive. So I will just say that the fault one is active. So here now in the fault blocks, I have two of them, a red one here and a pink one over there. I will perform a deformation, which is a sliding one. And actually, I forgot to show you here the different deformation types, but this is where you can select the type of deformation you want to perform. And I will perform a flexural slip and not moving the square deformation. Finally, what I want to do is I want to uh, restore the fold throw on the top of the green units. So I select use anchor here to say that the top of the green will match the top of the green right here. And the restoration is done. And here we see that the movement has been performed. Now we just have to draw the erosion. So to do that, I go to the erosion mode. I extend the fault, and then I can just draw the missing material. So here, some uh, recent units. Then I extend this fault again. I can add some material right here. And finally, I can finalize the erosion of that small block right here. Here it is. So here you see that the eroded material has been uh, drawn, has been defined. Um, so here we have finished our first restoration step and we can save it uh, right here as a key deformation step by giving it so five million years, for example. So now we have present day five million years right there. I sit, I allow myself to interrupt yes. you because we have two questions that are really related to this part of the demonstration. Okay. okay. Well, so the is, first one, is... uh, you just answered it on uh, compaction computation, is there a way to switching it up? So you went, you went quickly yes. through this step, but... So here when you create, so if I undo the deformation step, uh, so here control Z, okay. If I redo the create deformation step, you see here that you have uh, the possibility to compute the compaction. So I actually didn't take it into account, but you can <laughs> actually activate it uh, right here and say that you have either a fast or a precise decompaction. So you can either take it into account or not. So actually here, I didn't take it into account, but if I want to, I can do it uh, here. You can also compute it at any uh, given time. So here it's, uh, oh, what did I do? Create deformation, ah, but because I forgot to give an age, sorry. The compaction fast, okay. So here we have the step now with the compaction. At an any given time, you can also compute the decompaction from here uh, and launch the compaction on your restoration to see uh, what it would uh, give you as a result. Yes, and the second question is related to the type of uh, deformation you use when you, uh, for instance, snap a patch a block to a surface to a paleobatimetry. Is there an option to choose between yes. simple shear, flexural slip, and so on? Of course, yes. Uh, so if I go back, so actually if I keep going here, I can uh, do what I was doing before, or I can actually do it uh, right here. Actually, there is no problem with that. So here, if I display the paleobathymetry, draw it to a certain paleobathymetry like that. When I want to snap it, so I select the block. So for that, well, I can actually take the full block. That's that's okay. Uh, and here you see, I'm here I'm performing a movingly square. So I bring it up 
So here I select the yellow one and I bring it up. So here it's with a moving least square deformation method. But if I go back, I can select a flexural slip, for example, perform the same deformation right here. And here the result will be actually slightly different. It's not very obvious here, but you can here select the, the type of, of deformation that, uh, that you will perform right here. All right, thank you. You can keep going. Okay, so here if we go back to what uh, was done, so I did the first restoration step from zero to five million years. And actually to see the rest of the restoration, let's move to a project where everything is done. So zero, five, eight, 11, 14, 16. So here you see we have the restoration of each fold block through time and then a final simple uh, uh, backstripping, I would say, at the end. When you are happy with the restoration, you have your full scenario. You can go to Scenario Manager right here and actually first have a look at all the different, different hypotheses that you've done and select the main um, path that you want to consider in order to mesh it and send it to uh, your backstripping simulation. So to do that, you click on Mesh Scenario. You see it's going to be the green one that will be uh, meshed. And right here, you can define the resolution of the mesh that you want to apply. Here are 300 uh, meter cell size that is continuously deformed through time. So you see here that actually the computation of the, of the mesh was very fast, and you can actually have a look here at what it uh, corresponds, what it will look like, display some properties if you want, and generate your Temis flow scenario from here. So here you give the age of the first event, create a Temis flow scenario, that we name Charles Demo, and finish. So now we will move to the basin modeling part. So, okay. So I will actually close the two editors to see things better. And here you see the scenario that we just uh, created, which is named Chartreuse Demo here. And I can uh, open the, the GeoGrid right here to actually see that everything is done and uh, ready. So here you see that everything is ready. I have already the, the section that is uh, there and I can directly define uh, the missing information, like for example, the source rock in that case. So the lower Jurassic will be defined as a source rock unit. I will say that it's, uh, uh, I will give an index for the kerogene and I will define the initial TOC content uh, at 4%. I check just to make sure everything is okay. And when it's done, I can save the model. So here, everything is ready. I can just bring in a geochemical library to define the kerogene behavior and define the type of simulation that I want to perform. So in this case, I will just launch a directly a full Darcy, a decoupled Darcy migration, sorry, so migration simulation with a three class scheme. So let's save this and let's launch the simulation. So right here. So here you will see the everything uh, evolving. So while it's running, let me just show you the fault uh, properties editor just to have a look at uh, how it works. So here we said that all the faults are transparent. So that means their factors are set to one. So it, the behavior will just come from the connection of the different units on both sides of the fault. But here you could actually tune them. So for example, for the fault one, uh, which is the last one to uh, be uh, mobilized so at five million years, you can actually make uh, that fault uh, impermeable here, so all the factors will be set to zero, or you can make that fault user-defined, and in that case, you can select what is the factor for the permeability across and along, and what is the factor for the capillary pressure. So here with a high factor, that means you are making the fault more permeable, you are easing the flow, and by putting a factor lower than one, here you can actually uh, make the fault partially uh, impermeable, so with some, for example, for cementation uh, effects. And actually for the capillary pressure, it would be the other way around. So here that's good. Here we see that the computation is finished in 45 seconds uh, in that case. So here we have the results. So I can close the workflow logs. And here I will see all 
the results right here. So let's have a look uh, first at the vitrinite reflectance. Let's not start with the best yet. So here, this is the result in terms of vitrinite reflectance. So we are able to understand if the source rock is mature or not. So we see here that the source rock is within the oil window and here it is within the gas window. So we should expect to have some uh, expulsion. And if we look at the saturation, uh, which is right here, we actually see that we have some accumulations that are identified and that we can actually visualize through time. So this is first the filling. Here we have the first expulsion. And then here we see the migration of the hydrocarbons with the movement of the different features. And we can here see the different accumulations. We have the masses of oil and gas within uh, these accumulations. So we are able to say if, uh, the, if it's uh, gas or if it's oil. So here we, we see that it's a mix of oil and gas in that case. And we can actually track the information through time. So for example, if I open the transformation ratio uh, right here, I can actually select one of the cells. So I don't know why the color scale is actually this range. I will actually put it from 0 to 100. I can change the color scale right here. Select one of the cells and open right here a cell history. And here you see, so sorry, it opens in yellow, so I will just change the color to blue. So here you see the evolution of the transformation ratios through time, so you know when the source rock became uh, mature. And you can do the same uh, type of things, for example, for the liquid saturation in order to know when the uh, accumulation occurred. So here you can do the same thing, open cell history. So here is right here, so you see if you have some uh, accumulation or dismigration through time for the saturation, or you can open as well uh, here an HC composition uh, finish, which will give you here a graph of the composition of, uh, of everything that is within uh, that cell. And you can have also other informations like the, um, the porosity uh, here, the, the overpressure uh, or other properties right here that can be interesting um, in order to understand your accumulation. So I think this concludes the demonstration. Uh, I don't know, Marie, if we have some questions. I didn't display the norm of heat flow. Let me just finish with that here. So this is the norm of heat flow that we can actually visualize here uh, through time. And same thing, I can, uh, of course, open the evolution of one cell. So open uh, cell history right here. So for the norm of heat flow, and so this is the evolution of the norm of heat flow uh, through time for this cell. So we see it's around 68 uh, milliwatts through time. All right, we have two questions to finish. The first one is related to uh, mud diapirs. Are we able to deal with such structures? And do we have any example? So this uh, becomes tricky because a mud diapir usually uh, means two things. First, it can mean a multi-z uh, surface. And so in that case, the, we do not have, we cannot handle them directly. So that means we would have to split the, um, the sorry, we would have to split that uh, feature into uh, several, several zones. So it can be doable, but it requires a bit of expertise. And the second is to properly handle uh, the solid volume through time. And uh, that also can be a little bit uh, tricky during the computation. So yes, it can be done, but it will require some expertise. In terms of examples, uh, we have some examples with salt, not with um, diapirs. So we have performed some uh, complex uh, restorations within Kronos Flow involving salt movements. Um, and I think we can show you, we, we could have some, uh, some things to show you if, you if you want. Is it possible to export the restored section in other formats such as Move or GoCAD? So at the moment, no, uh, unfortunately. So what you will have is, uh, is the results uh, within the application. Uh, you can export it in a XYZ, so XYZ property format. So you would have a cloud of points. Uh, unfortunately, the, the overall mesh and model uh, cannot be exported outside of the platform at the moment. And uh, so this is it. No more questions. 
We thank you very much for attending the meeting. We hope you, you, found, you found it uh, interesting and useful. Thank you very much as well for all the questions that you have asked. It was uh, a rich interaction. So we will probably organize uh, another Kronos Flow webinar uh, within the next two weeks. We will keep you updated and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much and bye-bye.